Nigeria, the most populous black nation on earth, is battling the twin challenges of poor leadership and an ethno-religious fault line threatening to tear the country apart. While some misguided non-state actors are beating the drums of war and disintegration, many are cautioning against the breakup and have charted a way for peace, unity, and the good governance of the country. One of such groups is the custodian of national conscience, a broad coalition of faith-based leaders, consensus builders, and well-meaning citizens from all walks of life. The group, in a recent statement, made it abundantly clear that the redemptive destiny of Africa was tied to the success, stability, and progress of Nigeria. According to the CNC, only visionary leadership, national unity, and good governance will make all the difference in saving the country from further drilling. To intimate us on how the group can make a difference to the many problems confronting Nigeria and chart a path for good governance. We're now being joined by Pastor Sam Ayedogon, a member of the CNC and convener of the Catalyst for Global Peace and Justice Initiative. Welcome to the morning show. Uh, Pastor Ayedogon, good to have you here. Thank you, Dr. Ruben. It's Thank been you. a long while. This <laughs> Thank good you. morning. Great to be with you live. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, very quickly, uh, tell us about the CNC, this Sir? coalition, and your you know, concerns about justice and uh, progress in Nigeria, and your resolve uh, that why sit here and allow uh, what is going on? Why to sit here and die and <laughs> do nothing? Yes. Yeah, to all that. Oh, thank you for the privilege. You know, CNC is uh, the acronym for Custodian of National Consensus. And by the way, it's not political, it's not a political movement. Uh, it's a coalition, as you rightly introduced, of concerned Nigerians, concerned Christian leaders, concerned religious leaders, not just Christians. And well many in Nigeria across various divides, we realized, and uh, I'm representing a broad base of, of members of this coalition that are drawn from the evangelical circle of the Christian church, the Roman Catholic circle, and the Pentecostal, uh, and even non-Christian leaders. So I won't be speaking... Uh, in my own right, as a person, I'm expressing my view. But we, we discovered that the challenge we're facing is how to move from being independent. You know, as a human being, you start your life from being dependent. You are born dependent. Then you grow to become independent. But a time comes when you learn that you can achieve more by being interdependent. And that's what can lead you to create a, uh, a great posterity legacy. But whether we've gotten our independence rights is one is personally and as a nation, but we've not been able to get to a point where we can collaborate and you know, take advantage of being interdependent, right? So this is a group that is saying, we need to join hand across various divides. The Christian leaders in the South and even non-Christian need to join hands with the people in the North. You need to feel their pain. You need to know the issues and go beyond some stereotypes and some assumptions. You know, like thinking everybody in the North is a Muslim and is something else and everybody in the South is a Christian and all of that. And also feeling we are insulated in the South <laughs> to the challenges, which is now at our doorstep. So we, we feel like we need to build these bridges across various divides, collaborate, and take advantage, leverage on the concept of interdependence if we're going to preserve ourselves and, the, and the, 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 the future of our children, if we're going to save Nigeria, if we're going to uh, change the narratives. So this is what brought about the coalition we call Custodians of National Conscience. And uh, uh, if you look at the names that are drawn there, you have president of very large organizations, um, president of Equa Church, national president, president of Coastal Church, that is the uh, uh, Church of Christ in Nigeria, president of EYN, Ecclesia Yanwa, Nigeria, president of, uh, you know, some theological seminary in the north. We have top uh, Anglican uh, theologians. We have Someone like uh, uh, this uh, Roman Catholic priest in Abuja, 
Reverend Father George Hudson is one of us, and another Roman Catholic uh, priest who is the chairman of CAN somewhere in the north. And then we have a lot of leaders of Pentecostal church, and non-church leaders are involved in the coalition. And so it's been, it's been something new, and we are so convinced it's part of the solution we need, and it's, it's already making a difference. Okay, just some clarification. When you say non-church leaders, yeah. are we also looking at the Muslims? Absolutely. The Islam, traditionalists? Is it a coalition of everybody you're talking about? Absolutely. Uh, you know that the problem and the, the crisis we're facing, in insecurity, for instance, and hunger, mm -hmm. and the trauma from all of this, don't discriminate. Mm -hmm. So whether you're Muslim, you're Christian, you are, you are a traditional believer, if you believe in the value, the worth of the human life, which, which have depreciated terribly, if you feel that Nigeria can be something better, if you know that, you know, we can change the narrative, you're welcome on board. We're asking people to sign up. I mean, we, we came out with, uh, with a press release uh, just a few days ago in Daily Trust. It's coming out in this day, on you know, the newspaper. And we're saying... If you're concerned about Nigeria, and, and it's not just about joining a political party, which is important, of course, the need to overcome our apathy, to mobilize and participate in the political process. But let's come, let's find a forum where we can also speak with one voice, speak to the issues, non-violent communication, we underscore there, how to engage state actors, you know, maturely and in a very objective way, and hold them accountable and, and let them feel what we're experiencing because we are with the people. Those of us that are, you know, religious leaders, for instance, I get to know the pain of the people by reason of the little I'm experiencing with all the privilege I have. So I assume the people that don't have my privileges, I can't just imagine what they're going through. So... We need, to, we need to come together, and it doesn't matter what is your persuasion or your... Okay, perhaps we'll talk about the practicability a little bit more, but let's bring in Rufai into the conversation. Rufai, right. over to you. Thank you so much, Adesu, as always. Real quickly, I'd like to ask you, you said something in passing. Yeah. You did say that, like, a lot of people think that it's only Muslims that dominate the North. What are those intricacies and peculiarities in the North that you'd like to bring to the fore? And I'll underline that line, like a lot of people think it's only Muslims that dominate the North. Are there a sizable number of Christians? What is the mix like? Tell us more. Thank you, Rufa. Um, one of the, the stereotype and the assumption, which is grossly, falsely based, is not just thinking that only Muslims dominate the North. Some people feel it's only houses, you know, the people in the only houses. Now we're having the, this uh, uh, overgeneralization of the Fulani issue and so on. They don't know that we have so many ethnic groups in the north, like we have so many states in the corner, whether it's northeast, northwest, north central, people that are Christians, other nationality, other ethnic groups. So when you, when you sit back and you feel like, well, I think that was part of the problem. For instance, when the insecurity, the insurgency of Boko Haram started oh, about 11 years ago, people would say, oh, yeah, those are the people over there. Uh, and it's a religious affair and uh, it doesn't concern us. Until now, we discover it's right uh, in our forest, uh, whether in southwest and it's on the street in the southeast. So those assumptions... Which, which reveals that we are not being humane. I, I, I said in, in the puppy, which is my primary constituency, I would, I would rather speak without caution there so that I don't create complication here. Because when I'm speaking on the puppet, uh, I feel I'm... I'm you have a, a minute. I have him. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> well, because the dear me says you have freedom of speech. What he can guarantee is freedom after the speech. <laughs> so, well, I said there in the church that it's because we're in a metaphoric or spiritual darkness. That's why we feel what is happening there is for those people. They, we and them and all of that. We are not concerned. It's so far away. When you are in the dark, you don't know how close objects are. And you don't know how, the things that are far away, you assume they might be close and you have a lot of, uh, you know, apprehension. 
So I think that is what is happening. This is why there is, there is lack of connectivity. We have this problem of, uh, of people being, being so numb about what is going on. You hear that school children are kidnapped, for instance. Oh, it's those people in the north. In the north. It's far away. And you can think, how about when it comes to my children? If it's my daughter, if it's my son, or if, if I'm the one kidnapped. So those things are things we need to correct. And join people like the, the, the story of the, good, the narrative of the Good Samaritan. Uh, you know, Jesus said there was a priest that saw a man half dead mm. and walked the other way. There was a Levite, walked the other way. Someone without a, a, a title, someone without a religious uh, office came and saw this a human being like me and was moved with compassion. Are we being moved not just by people that are so impoverished, but by people that are not sure they will survive tonight? So I think it is those assumptions, I hope I answered my question well, uh, well of, of they and us and, and just, I live in the north. My wife and I, we started our missionary work, uh, you know, in the, in the 80s, and we stayed almost 10 years in the north. So we know, we know the intricacies, we know the difference, and in any case, we are all Nigerians. Well, uh, Pastor, you, uh, you made a point that the uh, custodians of national conscience, CNC, is not a political group. But when I looked at the press statement yes. uh, that you issued, I saw phrases there like the valuation of uh, human worth, yeah. uh, headers, uh, cow logic, um, corruption, religious bigotry, yeah. tribal rivalries. I mean, all these are political issues mm. in Nigeria. So how do you engage with uh, whatever constituencies without going into the realm of politics? Because even though your press statement, it's loaded with politics. Okay. And it, it will be so interpreted, I can assure you. Uh, the Christian uh, body in Nigeria had always talked about the persecution of Christians. And in that statement, you know, there were references to slavery and injustice. So how do you avoid politics when, in fact, what you are proposing is, uh, you know, basically political? Well, uh, Dr. Ruben, someone told me to watch out for your dangerous questions. <laughs> The point is that it's been said by, by experts that human beings are political animals. So, and uh, it's uh, at great risk, whether you may be, whether you are religious or not, that you get disconnected from politics and not be interested and not participate, where you suffer the rule or the rulership of fools when you do that. So the point is that the problems that are, that are crippling humanity and Nigerians, probably an offshoot of religious lopsidedness. And, uh, you know, to make a point of correction because of the people I represent, not just poor leaders. We don't want to say the leadership is poor. We want to say we lack exceptional leadership. So the problems are political because they are human problems. Even the, the religion has been politicized. <laughs> And politics also now is mixed with religion. So we can't address those issues without spelling them out. But what we mean by not being political is that we're not going to become partition. We're not going to become a political party, for instance. We're not going to queue up before one candidate. I think it insults the sensibility of, of people you lead, whether in church or in any group, when you come as a leader or as a, uh, you know, a social organization and you enforce a political position, a political personality, or, or you can give the parameters, you can give the qualification. So when we say we're not political, we mean we're not going to metamorphose into something else, but we always engage the issues. We always engage even the state actors and speak truth to power. And if you look at the, at the people we have, that signed up as a first set of signatory and we're having more coming on, you will know that these are people that don't shy away from reality. Mm. Well, in that press statement you released, you also talked specifically about elected representatives. Uh, I presume you're talking in general about those we elect into office, uh, whether it's uh, federal, state, or local. But is that the only set of leadership we should be looking at to take responsibility in the society? Uh, would you agree that some facets of society, perhaps even the religious leaders, have 
you know, blame also in all of this that we're witnessing in the country? Yes, I was, I was on this program called Reflection uh, with uh, Father Georgi Hussani of Luxterra in Abuja, and that question came up, and I said, the problem, the crisis in Nigeria is not just because religious leaders have not addressed the things they should address, mm -hmm. the content of a lot of the preaching is part of what created the problem, not just what is not allowing us to be able to solve the problem. And when I was writing for this day, uh, I was trying to follow after people like Ruben. I wrote for this day the religious speech for like 15 years, and I discovered it takes a lot. <laughs> so uh, when I was writing, the first article I wrote was the fact that the, the failure of political leadership in Nigeria can be situated, is domiciled with the failure of religious leaders. Because every state actor or every occupier of an important office either go to mosque or, or church or even a traditional priest somehow. So the question is, what are they told? What pressure do they face? What demand is put on them? So you're right when you say, are we just talking about leadership at local government, state, and uh, national assembly and the presidency level? Not at all. Leadership begins even in the home. So we're having a lot of challenges with domestic violence and all of that. We have a lot of dictators in the name of husband, and people are saying now that even some wives also are becoming dictators. They're in the minority anyway. So we can't address the leadership crisis except we go to the roots, to the foundation. The loss of values probably start in the home. What, 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 what is being projected, what's being modeled for our, for our kids? and all of that, the demands and all of that. So uh, it cuts across. And if we're not holistic in our approach, and like someone have said, if we don't do a proper diagnosis, then we're never going to get a panacea. And the, the, the problem is that it's not just people in visible position of power that are the problem of leadership. It's everywhere. And so we have to trace the virus and try to deal with the virus wherever they do me, sir. So that's the point. Rufai, over to you. All right. So two questions, sir. Number one, it's good religious bodies are coming together and talking. But a lot of people will say religion has been part of the problem. Isn't it time to try secularism in the first place? Because we've seen secular states that have done well, mm. devoid of religion. Mm. And speaking of religion, uh, since you say this body is coming together, what's your take on Sheikh Gumi? Sheikh Gumi's approach is to go to the bush to speak to the bandits, but they haven't changed. And that's why a lot of people are iffy about this religious slant to political problems in the country. Like some people have criticized Sheikh Gumi, and some people have said as a hero. What's your take on him? And what's your take on using secularism to fix the state rather than religion? Thank you, Rufa. Uh... I follow you on Twitter, I follow Ruben, I haven't gone at this your own. So I know you don't front religion, but I know you are a godly person. You are so the point is that uh, we're having problems because of the politicization of religion. Religion on its own is not the problem. It's the corruption of religion, like it is with anything. I mean, journalism can be corrupted, uh, politics can be corrupted, everything. So, to think that without religion we'll be better off, uh, you must well because people are not developed, whether mental, mentally, psychologically, and whatever. Religion is supposed to be part of what help people discover, discover the, the deity in them, if you will, the, discover genuine spirituality. It may say you can be spiritual without being religious, and you can be religious without being spiritual, without being godly. So I don't think religion is the only problem. We can't wish away religion. And to come to the issue of Sey Gumi, uh, without holding brief for him, and I don't agree with his method and a lot of the utterances, but I don't think it's only someone like Gumi that is challenged, you know, and running into complication trying to help and to fix the problem. We have Christian clerics also that have taken measures and made move and like they've somersaulted and 
Someone was saying the other day, I think it was Bishop Kuka, that uh, all the religious leaders, the prophets, whether they're Muslim or Christian or otherwise, that supported the current administration, they've all backed out now that they're no longer in good terms. So uh, you're having a situation where what is going on in Nigeria is challenging everyone. 10 years, 11 years ago, everybody that told us that this is the Messiah, this is what is going to solve the security problem. Both prophets and pastors and uh, sheikh and imams and even, you know, ex-president and so on and so forth. Everybody is coming and saying, we missed it. So if anybody is getting it wrong, I'm trying to be mature. I was we're doing the blame game before. You know, I was saying, oh, you told us this then. You said you were with this man and all of that. But we can't single anybody out now. So I would say, probably, and I might be wrong, say Gumi may mean well. But I think the problem is traumatizing everyone. In fact, someone have said we are all mentally challenged in Nigeria now. That in the mental health spectrum, we are somewhere in between the lowest and the extreme. So uh, because the things happening, just make you think, what you think is the best you turn out to discover that it's probably compounding the, the situation? Well, I mean, um, I agree that it's good for the church to organize. I think it's uh, Father George Usani who wrote the book, A Prophetic Church. And one of the chapters in that book by uh, Father George Usani uh, talks about, you know, uh, priests, pastors, leaders of the church, being on the side of the poor, identifying with them. I mean, he's your friend. I'm sure you've yes, read sir. the book. Uh, but I go back to the point, again, I made about how your group may be perceived. Uh, I think I've seen a tape in which you were criticizing uh, uh, President Buhari very passionately from the pulpit. Now, uh, this is a coalition. What are your worst fears? Uh, do you have the fear that you could be tagged, uh, uh, you know, an emerging Sunday Ubu of the uh, Nigerian church? <laughs> Do you have any such Ecclesiastical fears? Sunday Boho. Yes. Or Nam Oh, yes. <laughs> Do you have any such fears? Because you can, if you use the platform, you know, to criticize the government of the day, uh, then, of course, they, will, they are likely to say, no, this is no longer the pulpit. Hmm. This is something else. Do you have any fears along those lines? Well, it's been said in the scriptures, uh, Hebrew chapter 2, specifically, like 10 around verse 14, that people are held in bondage all their lifetime because of fear. And the greatest fear is the fear of death. The reason people can't speak truth to power, even address our issues realistically, is probably fear of one thing or the other. And I've said, and I was quoting one of my pastors somewhere, that the problem of Nigeria is not just insecurity, it's insincerity. And the insincerity is born out of fear. Uh, so we are fearless. I'm fearless. Uh, and like you rightly said, if you follow me on the pulpit and in order for... Uh, uh, I'm more explosive than this. But I'm learning, interacting with Catholic priests and bishops. And, you know, then when you see the signatory to our press statement, uh, time will not permit me to read them, but we're going to push them further. Then you realize I can't afford to be rascally and just be as I used to be, so I have to package myself. And then I knew I was coming to arise. I knew the people I was going to face. <laughs> so the point is, there is no fear of how we're going to be tagged. It's been said, if you are bound by the expectation and the interpretation of people, then you can't make a change. You can't do what you should do. So whether we are saying this way or that way, it's not the fact. We, we don't care what happens about that. But we want to engage in a very mature in a non-violent way, not just a motive way. We want to, we want to address the architecture of thought, like one of us used to say, uh, Reverend Laddie Thompson specifically has been on your show. Yes, yeah, it's one of the think tanks in this movement. We want to address the things that brought us to where we are. Our future is not in our past, but we won't understand where we are except we trace our steps, you know, because we keep saying, how did we get here and which way Nigeria? So, right. The point is this, uh, however we're perceived, that would be great, uh, but we, we believe that the problem is not going to be solved by, by tearing Nigeria apart, by, you know, decimating Nigeria, uh, and by option, uh, is it plan B, C, E to Z, that is not going to work. I hope my brother uh, was quoted out of context. 
Uh, and when the thing was so heated up before the arrest of Sunday, oh no, he wasn't arrested here in the Benin Republic, before the whatever was, however uh, Namdi Kanu was gotten, I came up with a message and I said, Nigeria is not going to break apart. I remember uh, Charlie Boy, who is, who is my friend, he's my, he says I'm his spiritual consultant, he's my confidant, we, we tag along very well. Charlie Boy put me on his way and said, I feel Nigeria is going to scatter. We all need to find what to do. And I said, you know what? Everything is going to calm down because that's the assurance God is giving me. I have thousands of people following me in church that look up to me. Though I'm traumatized myself, I'm challenged, but I have to give them. And I said, if we're all going to scatter and run away and become refugee, I have to be responsible for them. So... I think God will not be fair enough to leave us in the dark if everything is going to go down the drain. So I'm saying uh, then, I, I'm saying now, as I said then, that everything is going to come together. Everything is going to, somehow, somehow, we always dance at the brink as Nigeria. Uh, but we somehow, God stab, we shouldn't take that for granted. God stabilizes things. So the point is that we just want what needs to be done to be done. We need to say what we need to say, do what we need to do. And be fearless. As a matter of fact, the, the coalition is made up of people like, don't mind who takes the credit and how we perceive. But we want to be sure we engage responsibly in a credible, mature way. And we believe with time. Because a lot of people have come out with brilliant initiative and then they change the goalposts and, you know, somewhere along the line. Uh, but I've been on this lane for quite a while. So well, people that know my antecedents know that uh, I try to be consistent. Well, we'd like to thank you very much uh, for joining us, Pastor Sam uh, Ayedogon. And uh, we wish you all the best with the custodians of the national conscience, uh, CNC. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Ruben and Adisha. It's been a pleasure being with you. Thank you. Thank you.